Despite what you hear, this could be the year you save the most on groceries. In this month's Pantry Chat, I'm here to shrink your stress so that you can still eat real food on a real budget. The first rule in spending less is that you need to be able to justify what is going in your cart, which is why each month I share my grocery guide with you to print or view from your phone. Second, there's not a coupon that can be keeping your budget in check like planning your meals around the seasons. Just because you can purchase any variety of produce throughout the year doesn't mean you should, and you will pay an extraordinary markup every Every time you get this wrong. Case in point, ever notice how expensive tomatoes and strawberries are during the winter? That's because grocery stores are paying more to import that produce from warmer climates and they're passing that expense right on to you. Whereas if you stuck to the foods on this list, you'd be paying rock bottom prices. I'm showing you six different recipes you can make now, freeze, or can to have your own shelf stable <laughs> ingredients. There's gonna be a link below this video you'll want to click because it has the grocery guide I made for you that you can use as you shop later this month. It has a list of the fruits and vegetables you should stock up on because they're in season and at their lowest price even without a coupon and will be abundant for the next few weeks or months. My grocery guide even gives you a few recipe cards, two per page, that you can print and add to your recipe box or binder. Now, as I read this list, start to think about your preservation plan. Because in addition to eating it fresh, are you also gonna can it, freeze it, ferment it, dehydrate it, whatever, so that you have enough to last when you can no longer source it inexpensively or grow it yourself. So the fruits that you wanna meal prep around this month include apples, avocados, citrus, cranberries, kiwi, kumquat, lemons and limes, pears, and persimmon. And the vegetables that you wanna meal prep around include allium bulbs, beets, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, celery, cauliflower, chicories, fennel, greens like your turnip, kale, and mustard greens, leeks, mushrooms, parsnips, potatoes, rutabagas, sweet potatoes, turnips, and winter squash. If you've been skipping out on winter squash, let me show you a recipe that'll make you reconsider. Butternut squash is incredibly versatile, and since it's now in season, it's readily available and very affordable with prices under a buck per pound. After slicing your butternut squash in half, place it in the oven to roast until tender, then use ground turkey, chicken, or sausage like I am and cook until it's well done. I had a few apples that were starting to wrinkle, so I salvaged them by dicing them and adding them to the pan to lend a bit of sweetness and texture. Next, you'll add chopped onion and garlic, a bit of kale, or any winter green of your choice. Last, I added some sage still growing in my green stalks, and sage and pork are a perfect pairing. By this time, your squash will be ready to be taken out of the oven. Carefully scoop out the flesh to remove the seeds, which can be roasted and taste similar to that of pumpkin seeds. Continue to scoop about a 3 4 inch border around the sides and deposit the flesh into the sausage mixture. Now, generously add your filling. These squash Squash boats are so tender that they'll cut with a butter knife with the skin on. Now I had some extra sauerkraut on hand, which I added to give this a tangy topping, but sour cream or even left plain are equally satisfying. Didn't this dish cook up quick? The full recipe is in this month's grocery guide. If this is our first time meeting, hi, I'm Cassandra from the blog becomingafarmgirl.com. I'm here to help you start canning your own delicious ingredients and create a home can pantry your family will love. I've got a second meal that uses squash, but before that, I need to know if you've stocked up on your ham and turkey. Even if you've had your fill over the holidays, January is usually a sure bet that you're going to see prices drop to half off or more per pound than the prices you paid last month. So sweetheart, if you think between now and next December, you're gonna have a taste for a turkey or ham, soup, salad, or sandwich, now is your time to strike. Yes, you can stick these meats in the freezer, but what's really going to give you a longer shelf life and meals that are ready to go and fully cooked is if you pressure can these meats. Plus, when you're working with a full bone-in bird, you get all the free byproducts like broth, bouillon, and sauces. Plus, soups and stews are perfect during the cold weather months, and I refuse to buy them canned and I want you to consider doing the same. For starters, they're extraordinarily overpriced. A single can will cost you over $2.20 for just 12 ounces. Second, they will always be inferior to anything you can dump in a pot and make yourself. Remember the video I did where I was huffing and puffing about the unmitigated gall of a company that claimed they were giving you chunks in their suit when it was really more like tidbits? My and your homemade soups are the only way to get back to the portions and quality you really want to have. That's why these next soup recipes are a must on your list this month. But first,
me show you how to break down a ham. I've been tracking my ham prices, which were over $2 a pound last month, but are now 99 cents a pound. See, this ham was selling for $26.44, but I got it for $9.45. At that price, I snagged two hams and tucked them in my fridge. I knew this was a good sale because Aldi, which is usually the cheaper store, was still selling their hams for $1.69 per pound. But Aldi did have the cheaper turkeys knocked down to 69 cents a pound, down from $2.49 a pound. If you're a grocery geek like I am, you know that I was only too tickled to start putting this meat to use. When it was time to break down my ham, I did so pretty easily. I started by separating the outer layer of fat, which you should absolutely save to add flavor to soups, stews, and beans. I'll add a huge hunk to whatever I'm cooking and simmer it with the other ingredients to infuse the dish with a rich ham flavor and then just remove it before serving. Others will roast or fry the skin until it becomes crispy and golden brown, or make cracklings with the skin, which are delicious as a garnish, similar to French's fried onions, if you ask me. Use a sharp knife to make incisions starting at the thicker side and work your way towards the center of the meat, which is where you'll find the femur bone for a typical bone-in ham. Your hands are kitchen tools too, so don't be afraid to use them to claim as much meat as you can. Now that I've got my meat in a bowl, it's time to cut these larger portions into roughly cut cube-shaped portions for the soups I plan to make with it. To make kitchen tasks easier on myself, this was the day I planned just to break down my ham and put everything into bags that I'd store on the fridge so that in the coming days, I could just scoop and portion out the meat. Often you'll see me in the prep or finishing stages of meal prep because you don't always have to complete everything in a single day. But are you starting to see how I affordably stock my kitchen and how you can do the same? You'll find plenty of dried beans on sale this month, black eyed peas being pretty much the role. And look, I grabbed a pound of these for a dollar. that soaking beans is not merely a functional step, it's an artful part of meal preparation. And you're watching me make my own shelf-stable jars of soup for 20 cents a quart. I promised to return to the butternut squash, so here we are. This time, I'm removing the skin to feed my worms in my compost bin. They love foods like squash and pumpkins, but feel free to leave the skins on. Heat a pan with a bit of oil or baking drippings if you're thrifty, then toss in the squash to tenderize. This recipe is also in your grocery guide. After the squash is tender, remove it from the pan and set it aside in a bowl. Now in the same pan, saute some chopped onion and garlic for just a couple of minutes, then return the squash to the pan and add a squeeze of lemon, then enough chicken stock to fill the pan. Since my beans are waiting for me on the other burner, I'm just going to scoop some into the soup. I can't wait until I'm regularly harvesting kale from my garden again, but until I do, it's a purchase that I'll make for the next month or two. Now I'm adding the diced ham. A pot of soup simmering on the stove is just the perfect winter fragrance to fill your home with. Now watch me take this same bag of ham and head back to the other burner and add a few scoops for my white bean and ham soup that I'm going to can. Y'all, meal prep doesn't get any easier than this. Let's make pinto bean patties with a jar I canned last year with an Easter clearance ham. Let me stir these up and show you how my homemade beans are vastly superior to anything on a supermarket shelf. Do you see the tenderized meat and onions and goodness, an open jar leaves you thinking that I had these beans simmering low and slow all day. Now sitting on a shelf, a jar of beans may look a little cloudy as a residual starch is released, but out of the jar, it is back to a thing of beauty. Wouldn't you agree? All right, let's keep it moving. This recipe is also in your grocery guide, but you basically use a pat of drippings or oil to saute a mix of peppers and green onions. Once that's fragrant and the peppers have softened, pour in your pinto beans. I'm seasoning with a bit of garlic powder, chili flakes, and a must is Cajun seasoning. Cook until everything is heated throughout, then remove the pan from the heat. The meal is almost done. We've just got to use a masher to smush the beans so that we can shape them into cakes. After you do that, you'll add some breadcrumbs. I'm using whole wheat panko crumbs and an egg to bind everything together. Then make sure it's well mixed. Just keep looking at it. You'll know when it's stirred up enough. 
Grab another dish that has ah, two or three more cups of breadcrumbs, then form the mixture into a patty with your hands and coat all sides of your cake with the crumbs. Let me tell you, these humble bean cakes will stick to your ribs and are delicious. This is also an extremely affordable meal. When I don't have peppers, I've used fennel, cauliflower, broccoli stems, and celery with just as good results. Next, we're going to fry them up just a minute or two on each side. As you start to turn them over, you'll want to dig in right away, but there's just one more thing we do when we remove them from the pan. These patties are perfect for toppings, and I like to create my own barbecue sour cream dip that goes perfect with the Cajun seasoning, pinto beet, and ham flavor. If I had avocados, I'll dollop with a bit of guac. Beans are a satiating cold weather comfort food that are easily overlooked. I hope this is a recipe you'll try because I know you'll love it. What I'll often do is just plate all the patties on one platter and put the dipping sauce off to the side, sprinkle with uh, some green onion and take it directly to the table. Unashamedly, I'm going to give you an even closer look at these crunchy, savory delights. Spread your delicious barbecue sour cream mix on top, then cut through your hefty bean patty. Ooh, look at all the fun and flavor we've got in these cakes. Rush the fork to your mouth and don't blame me if you have an after dinner snooze because you ate one too many of these delicious patties. Some folks ring in the new year. Nope, around these parts we eat it in, which has to be a specific meal of black eyed peas, collards, and cornbread. This classic meal sits at the heart of so many homes, which is why I was so excited to get my hams. You've likely heard the phrase that beans are the poor man's meat, which I believe to be a misnomer because it oversimplifies the nutritional value and culinary versatility of beans, as well as their overall desirability. The truth is beans have distinct textures and flavors that can enhance dishes in their own right, rather than merely serving as a substitute for meat. That ham, along with the collards that I made and froze last month for dad, gave us a beautiful meal and homemade ham broth. Have you ever heard of cordon bleu cornbread? Yup, it's exactly what it sounds like, and when you've got as much ham as I'm working through, you put it on your menu. I bake my cornbread in a silicone bread pan, which I love using because removal is always so seamless. Then I just slice things up. You'll take two slices of cornbread, top them with ham, and then a slice or two of Swiss cheese. Assemble a few more sandwiches and then just stack them on a cast iron pan to bake until the cheese has melted. Eh, about five minutes. What comes out are these delicious treats that combine everything you love. Ham, cheese, and cornbread. Open wide, you've got a big mouthful coming. The next day, my ham broth was ready, so I canned some more smoked turkey necks that I caught on clearance, along with a few more quarts of soup. If you're making bone broth this month, remember the best bones for bone broth are the ones that contain the connective tissue, because that's where most of the collagen is located. For beef, your best combination is the marrow and beef knuckle bones. If you've never had bone marrow before, you might want to take the leap. It's luscious and creamy when roasted and tastes nutty, beefy, and buttery. In short, it just is delicious scooped from the bone and then toasted on crusty bread. After you've placed your bones in your pot, pour in the apple cider vinegar, then fill your pot with cold water. Now I want you to leave your pot off the heat for at least 30 minutes. Leaving the stock pot away from the heat for that 30 minutes or even longer prevents the heat from killing off the live cultures and enzymes in the apple cider vinegar before they can do their good work. From there, you can add your veggies and a bit of sea salt and turn on the heat and let it cook. And remember to skim your stock to keep it clear and remove excess fat. I hit the jackpot, baby. I found chuck roast that would have been $23.07, knocked down to $10.76. Now, this was not a meal that I needed this week or had planned on, so I knew that this was going to be a freezer meal. And since I already have all the other seasonal fixings, things like carrots and potatoes and onions, this was perfect to go ahead and use them up and make a hearty winter soup. Some women light candles to fragrance the house, but beef stew is an aroma I'll take wafting through the air any day. Now, cooked low and slow, this meat tenderized so nicely. 
after removing a portion to freeze later for some of my freezer meals, I then use some of the reserved broth to make another pot of just strictly vegetable soup using a few other veggies that I had on hand. I'll likely add, I don't know, like beans or pasta to this later, but that roast beef flavor was so good, I wanted to use every single drop. So earlier I made a claim that this may be the year you save the most amount of money on groceries and I meant it. I want you to start tracking your purchases. And don't dismiss this idea thinking that I'm asking you to add one more thing to your plate that you don't have time for, so let me finish, okay? Because even though you do have a dozen other things to do, you still found time to watch this video because I reckon you thought I have something helpful to share. But honey, let me tell you, a price book will be way more helpful than I could ever be. While I'm happy to share the deals that I'm getting, we all know that prices vary from state to state, heck, even from city to city and from store to store. So how do you know that a deal you see is really a good one? So many, many years ago, I had a price book and I wish I kept it, but I also had my my Nana and my mom and the church mothers and we would regularly talk about this stuff and so essentially they were my record-keeping system but this year I'm starting one with you you don't have any excuse not to make one because you can make a price book for just a dollar or you can use the free templates that I provided in this month's grocery guide just saying. Now you probably think that I'm going to ask you to start tracking everything you buy. No ma'am, that would be a bit too much. Instead, I want you to create a list of the 10 items you purchase on a regular basis. So for us, it's milk, coffee, eggs, creamer, butter, bacon, chicken, cheese, oatmeal, and olive oil. Let me show you how to set up your price book in minutes. If you already have a marble notebook around the house and prefer to use it instead of my printable sheets, here's what you'll do. Turn to the last few pages of the notebook and count out two to three pages. Fold these pages down into a triangle. You'll want to use several pages because it provides more heft and reinforcement than just using a single page. Take the folded pages and position them against the back cover. It should look like this. See how we've created a storage pocket? Then take some tape and secure the bottom of the pages to the back cover like I'm showing you here. You'll tape along the short side too, and after you do that, you'll have a pocket that we'll use to keep extra handouts, sales flyers, and receipts for the coming months. Okay, now let me show you how to create tabs in your notebook. Use the two red lines as your guide. The light red line is called your cap line, and this is what we'll be cutting to create waterfall tabs that will help you easily turn to a page in your price book. The first tab will be several pages, so reserve five or six pages. Using the cap line, cut up to the first horizontal blue line, then cut vertically to the cap line to remove the excess. It should look like this, and if these directions aren't crystal clear, just keep watching me. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing, but this time cut off the second horizontal blue line. I like to use a marker so I can know which line I'm cutting off. So you'll use the light red line and then cut up to your dot and then across to remove your sheets. Do this eight more times and then write your foods on each tab you created. The final product will look like this. Now create the headings. You have the date, when and where you purchased the item, the store or where, the item and the brand, like Heinz or generic, the price and size, which is the amount you paid and the total quantity, and then you'll calculate the unit price from the previous column and write that down, like 22 cents per ounce. For longer term storage, I recommend having another folder to store your sales flyers and receipts in over this next year. I like this pocket folder I found at Walmart because it's clear and has 12 front to back pockets I can label for each month. This is another way to pick up on specific store trends you notice and you will start to notice things. And oh, don't forget to tuck the monthly grocery guides I'm giving you in here or in your price book. I'm giving you homework every month this year, so I need you to come to class or uh, these monthly pantry chats prepared. You absolutely need to keep your receipts. I know everyone wants to go paperless, but no ma'am, some things need to be printed. And all I want you to do with them for now is tuck them away. Between my mama and the skills I'm learning as a farm girl, if no one has ever told you, you should always maneuver your non-food items out of season. Competition and prices are always lower because the masses aren't thinking about it. 
but you and I aren't the masses. I remember this very well because it's still a habit that I continue to this day, but I remember at the end of every season, my mom would take my brother and I to the store and she would shop those end of season sales. And so what she would do is just either like hold the pants up to our waist and, you know, roll them down a few inches and buy, you know, the next size. And you know what? We always had what we needed come the following year. Y'all, between thrifting and shopping for non-food items out of season and getting our food and preserving it while it's in season, we are consistently paying way less for almost half the things we buy. And that creates margin for the things that you can't negotiate on. The other day when I was at Wise, I always checked the clearance section and look what I found. So these are things that I ordinarily would not even be tempted to buy, but at this price, it's like, oh yeah, like I could have a use for that. So I picked up two of these rechargeable flip fan and built in power bank um, things. I know you've seen them. I think like people use these at like amusement parks, but even when I'm just like outside on the deck or walking Thor, or just out and about, I thought that these would be nice, you know, for one for me, one for my husband to have, I mean, $3.74. You can't beat that. This is, this is nice. All right. So this is something that my neighbor has that again, I would have never just purchased um, if it wasn't on uh, <laughs> clearance for this price, y'all. So they are these, let me just show you. They're strong and powerful. They're like magnets for your sliding glass door. Can you see that? It's, it's these things right here and it even says like they're great for pets and I do have a dog Thor that is like my shadow so anytime I go in or out he's like right there behind me but I also like especially like during the spring um, or cool summer nights when it's really nice and you want to have like the windows open but or sometimes even like the screen door uh, or whatnot but you don't have to keep like opening shutting opening shutting and this automatically like the door shuts behind you y'all the original price is um well these magnetic things shut behind you $14.99 $14.99 can you see that there I got this for three dollars and three dollars and 74 cents two of these so at that price I was like okay I'll go ahead and grab one and then I might give the other one to my folks or like maybe Kevin and Monica want one for their sliding deck door I mean, I just, like, what a blessing. Um, and then I was thinking of my husband um, in the area that he's at right now um, just for his, his work office, which uh, changes. But I know that it's not equipped for air conditioning. It happens, y'all. Um, but look, it is, the regular price on this was $39.99, $40. They marked this little portable air conditioning unit down to $10. So I'm not exactly sure how it works, but at that price, I was like, hey, like I'm willing to try it, but I guess you just fill it with, you know, water and it blows some type of air on you. I mean, you could get those little uh, battery charger fans and those are going to be around $10. So I just like being able, like, this is how I'm able to kind of have different features by always kind of like keeping my eye out on the clearance section, yeah, no one's thinking about an air conditioning unit right now because we're, you know, in winter. No one's thinking about, you know, any of this stuff, which is, you know, the upcoming season. But y'all, it's going to be here before we know it. So I'm going to tuck it away for a few short months and then I'll have exactly what I need when the warm weather hits. If you've been following these pantry chats, then you already know that January is when I do my Christmas shopping for the next year. I cannot fathom why you would want to pay full price for items that you can find 50 to 75% off the day or two after Christmas. So on Christmas Eve, I made the mistake of thinking I was going to dash out to the craft store to get some pieces to make some feather earrings. And I could not believe the crowds that were out. And I said to myself, oh my goodness, that's why I don't participate in any of this foolishness. That's why I grocery shop during the week. So I'm strategically not out with the crowds. I mean, I just saw all that traffic. So I turned my little tail around and I went home with renewed appreciation for my Christmas clearance routine. And the best part is, is that the day after Christmas, like the day or two after Christmas, I'll head out normally pretty early. And at this time, I will get all of my Christmas goodies and and hardly anyone is in the store, so it's actually a quite peaceful shopping experience. All right, so here's the big old bag of what I got. And remember, if you go back to last year's January pantry chat, you're gonna see that I already have still tons of like uh, tissue paper and bags and all that kind of stuff that's ready to go. 
but when I went to, and it's fun to see. So I do like to just do things that of course um, aren't perishable and that I know will keep long term. So when I went to Aldi and I'll put in the footage there, y'all, I found these boxes of tea. They are um, candy cane, so like a peppermint and then sugar cookie. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven of those um, to give out. And when I looked at the expiration date, y'all, they, they don't expire until March of 2025. Um, so yeah, this one is October 2025. I didn't make sure um, to look. And so these are gonna be fine when I put them in my storage uh, tote that stays in the attic. And then I figured that I could probably just do, you know, maybe um, something that I feel like with um, honey. Oh, oh, I've got to get those. I forgot to bring those up as well. You'll see what I mean in a minute. And then I also found these fragrance uh, warmers. So there were two designs. So this one, uh, it might be too bright for you to see, but it's just, it's a snowflake uh, pattern that's on here. Can you see that? Yeah, it's a snowflake uh, pattern. And you can just put like a wax melt on top. And so I found these um, for half off. They were like less than, oh, I found this pattern. And then I also found uh, this pattern that's here. I really like the winter snowflakes. But I ended up getting one, two, three, four, six, six of those. And then I also found some holiday bags that were marked down and I may use it for the upcoming season. These might be ideas that if I, you know, want to bake cookies or whatnot, um, I'll use the season after next. They're not going to go bad, but they do have a uh, snowman that are on here. And this is another kind of like holiday tree theme. All right. So then I also found these um, Christmas colored mugs that were marked down to a dollar. And so I thought, oh, that'd be really, really cute to kind of put together like a little beverage gift where I stick a couple of like tea bags in here, some cinnamon sticks, maybe, um, you know, portion out some marshmallows. Just, I don't know, like it's going to come together for sure. But I found four of those mugs and then, or actually, I could do something, you know, I like to dehydrate my own um, kind of like fruits and different things. I could do something where I do that. And then since I got these wax melts and I could not have planned this, but it always works out like this. So I have this that people can immediately kind of like put to use. And then <gasps> these are marked down to just 50 cents. I think it was 50 cents, either 50 cents or a dollar. I'll, I'll put in um, the price of everything. But these are by Better Home and Garden. <laughs> but this is a brownie and pecan. Smells amazing. I got two of those. This wax melt is orange and cinnamon rolls, smoked vanilla and embers. And then, oh, this one was a good one. Sugar, marshmallow, and cocoa. Oh, oh my goodness, that smells so good. I also just found some uh, gift tags, again, that were marked off. These are probably 50 cents each. Um, I got some more hooks just for our own tree. Again, they were marked off. And then I have really enjoyed just giving folks ornaments. I got one for me, though. This is the only time that I have purchased an ornament, like, from a store. But when you see it, you will know why I had to get it for this year. And I want to personalize it a little bit, but... In honor of becoming a huntress this year, ah, look what I found. I found these antler um, ornaments. I just, like, I had to. I had to. <laughs> but for um, ornaments to give away this year, I found this. I try to just stick with something really neutral or, like, traditional kind of themed. Oh, this one was super cute. And then I found this nice little kind of like baking ornament. So I'm just gonna put this stuff in the plastic tote and then Trey will take it to the attic for me. And I cannot tell you how relieved I am to already have all of my little gifts for um, the neighbors here and our Caldi sack and you know a few coworkers at work just already finished for the upcoming year because you know the holiday time 
as joyful as it can be, it can also just be a pretty stressful uh, time. And so just knowing that my I've given myself the gift of time to really just enjoy, um, you know, that season and the few days that I get off of work and that I am not stretching, you know, myself um, or our budget for, you know, just gifts that are small tokens of appreciation or thinking about you. It's just something that I will always do year after year, season after season. Are you ready for a cuteness overload? My friend Crystal and I have been hatching out baby quail for the upcoming season. Take a look. Quail generally take 18 days to incubate, but they can hatch as early as day 16 or as late as day 20. On day 14, you'll need to stop turning the eggs. Turn it off so it doesn't beep. See the, do you see it? This one stopped developing. See how it's dark on the bottom? Yeah. So it started, oh, but it stopped. Okay. Now, if it wasn't fertile, it would all be this lighter color. Monitoring the development of your chicks allows you to detect health issues early. I just got the call from Crystal that the quail are hatching, so I'm on my way. Do Don't you feel like we were nice. like having a baby? Don't laugh because I think I kind of did. It was the excitement of it all. Birth is beautiful and watching the eggs hatch over the course of the next few hours, well, oh, more like until 1 a.m., was indeed a very special occasion. you will ever see quail. These little ones were so tired from hatching, they fell asleep in our hands. Oh, Crystal. Just little babies. They're, so little babies. they're just little babies. And they're not sex linked, so not until they start getting busy. <laughs> okay, so we have eight weeks. Sexual matur maturity, but because of the sun, um, because of the time of year we are, we won't know until spring. Just wants to take a nap in your hand. Do you have suspicions or a way that you kind of tell even before that? Oh, nope. okay, okay. Nope. After everyone hatched and dried out a bit, we moved them to a box to transport them to their brooder. So let's go back to how I'm a bargain shopper who shops out of season. Getting set up for quail does entail some expense, but since I've apprenticed with Crystal, I'm very sure on what to get and what to avoid. I absolutely knew that I wanted to go with Manola Ranch cages, and that's what Crystal has, because you cannot beat the build or the quality. This is a business that's right here in the US and his prices are fair. But let me give you the cost for what the small setup that I want to manage about 30 birds would be. I wanna read this part from my note so I don't get this wrong. The double cage I would need is priced at $220. So that's one cage with um, two sides on the top and then two sides on the bottom. The waterers are $25 each and I need at least two of them, ideally four. The egg protectors are $15 each and I would need four. And then I would need two pen partitions. That total cost would be $406. I haven't even mentioned feed, fans, tarp, incubator, or brooder materials. I mean, do you see how easily I could get to six or $700? So I've been stalking Facebook Marketplace since the fall, and I finally caught a break. So I found a lady who was also raising quail in her backyard, but she wanted to upgrade to some larger cages, and she was gonna sell her smaller cage to me for $200. But again, we started talking, and she was like, hey, I'll take 150. The waterers and the pin partitions were included. Now I did have to drive up to Chambersburg, but this deal couldn't be beat. Plus I love a drive up to PA. 
So since I was sliding in way under where I thought I would be, I was able to grab a stainless steel sink that I was also looking at for $40. So I drove out to the Eastern shore and got my sink. going to like this option because all I have to do is just hook up the garden hose and anytime I go to harvest quail I can just do that entire process you know outside all of the harvesting without having to bring the birds inside. Will I catch everything for our future homestead on sale? Likely not. But when you think about the investment that a homestead is I mean that's why I appreciate so much that we are not in any rush to get there because it is giving us breathing room and margin to be able to find the equipment that we need across you know several years um and these will be pieces that we are going to continue to use once we find our property and so if you are building a homestead from scratch like we are meaning you're not really inheriting anything from anyone Making moves while you're already, you know, in your apartment, in your townhouse, wherever you are, that's not, you know, your forever property is really a game changer. And the time that you have um, in your space is something to leverage because, I mean, it will really put you at an advantage in the years to come. Plus, as I continue to volunteer on other homesteads, I can't tell you what a confident buyer I have become because I am gleaning from the mistakes that they made with different purchases. And now I know I can avoid that and get exactly the piece of equipment that will do what I need it to. So last month I got kind of lost in my thoughts thinking if I was going to continue the pantry chats. And I cannot say thank you enough for all of the kind words and encouragement that you shared in the comment section. I read through so, so many of them and there was one comment in particular that really summarized, I think, what most people were saying. And I love how just blunt she put it. And I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something to the effect of, now, Cassandra, if you say that these pantry chats remind you of visiting your Nana, did you and her have conversations where you would repeat the same thing over and over again? Honey, look, the people that enjoy hearing you talking about this are going to continue to watch your pantry chats. Oh, she got to the heart of it because yes, although Nana and I would, you know, talk about updates and new things that were happening, I cherished and looked forward to seeing if she would still laugh at the same old jokes and if we would tell the same old stories after hearing them for literally hundreds of times. And yes, we always did. And in a world of new this and that and updates, I do crave for some things to just stay the same. So here's to another round of pantry chats because honey, I'm not just making meals. I'm preserving memories and you are too. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care, friends.